You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of the podcast. But before we get going, this is the most, probably the most exciting news you're going to hear in a very long time. A six-week video series is coming out on the evolution of Adam. Yes. I wrote that book. You did. And this is now a six-week video series on a book that I wrote. Yeah. And it's actually not just six weeks, it's six sessions. So don't underestimate That's people. That's true. They you might want to do it like it in one day. Before breakfast. That's right. I would. So starting October 28th, it will be available. The pricing for one week only is pay what you can. We always want to make this accessible for people. So, but it's only that way for one week. So go to the biblefornormalpeople.com front slash evolution video. And the series includes six 10 to 12 minute videos with discussion questions. So it's great for groups as well. If you'd like to do it as a group, feel free. Or if you're an introvert, if you're an introvert, do that. Yeah. You can and be smarter than the group, right? <laughs> Be ahead of the curve for exactly. once in your life. For competition. That's what we're all about here. Of course here. it is. So, the Bible from people dot com. It's evolution. Solution. It's evolution, man. A competition. Hey, I'm trying to give the link here. Oh yeah, go ahead. Give the link. The Bible from people dot com front slash evolution video. Okay, on to our episode for today. Yes. What is that? Our topic is what did the crucifixion do? And our guest is Jennifer Bashaw. Jennifer is assistant professor of New Testament and Christian ministry. And as you'll see as she's talking, I love this combination of both of these. Her scholarly side on the New Testament, but also very pastoral side. And that is at Campbell University. And she mentions a guy named Rene Girard, mm -hmm. and that has to do with a book she's coming out with next year called Scapegoats, The Gospel Through the Eyes of Victims. But just for everyone who's been asking this question for a long time, this is probably one of the questions we get asked the most. What do we do with the atonement? What did mm -hmm. Jesus' crucifixion actually do? So, here's your episode yeah. where we talk about some of this complexity. And it's a question that I'm speaking from personal experience. I this is existentially meaningful to me because I like I remember years ago I think I mentioned this in the episode but years ago I just started thinking about it I was like I have no idea. And part of the issue, not the problem, but part of the issue is that the New Testament itself uses different metaphors for trying to get at it and I think that's a good way of putting it they're trying to get at it and that's sometimes called a kaleidoscopic view taking all the colors and shapes into account and not sort of privileging one over others and as a result you have various views various metaphors and uh, that alone is something just worth holding on to and saying okay this is interesting it's a different way of thinking than here's what it means always and for all time right all right well let's have this conversation Paul recognizes all of this is a mystery, right? And I think that we have lost that concept of the mystery of not just God, but what God is doing in Jesus. And so we don't want mystery. We want to be able to give these concrete words and diagrams and PowerPoint presentation about it, but we, we've lost the mystery. And if Paul acknowledged it, even as he's trying to explain it, like how are we to think we, we don't have mystery? We don't need mystery when we think about God. Welcome, Jennifer, to the podcast. So excited to have you on. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Well, before we jump into the topic, which I'm, I'm eager, chomping at the bit to get into, because I think it's going to be really relevant to a lot of people, just tell us, uh, you know, why, why devote your life to studying the Bible? How did that come about for you? Yeah, so, well, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, and actually, as many bad things that came out of that, there were some good things, and that was just, it implanted this love for the Bible inside of me. And I got a call to ministry while I was in a Southern Baptist church, and so I've had sort of a long journey trying to figure out what my calling looks like and what what direction I should have headed. And so I ended up not just working in churches, but also studying the Bible, especially the New Testament, on a PhD level, because I wanted to understand it better and then make it understandable to people in the church. And so I've sort of always been with one foot in the church and one foot in the academy, and I just love studying the literature of the Bible. That, it couldn't have a, a more perfect guest to talk about what we're going to talk about today, because this comes up so much with people at the Bible for all people, and we keep deferring it and deferring it <laughs> as much as we possibly can. It's we, not that important. <laughs> which is, how do we think about Jesus and, and the big three, the death, resurrection, ascension. Like, what does it mean for Jesus to have died, resurrected, and ascended in Christian theology? So, 
it's not as simple as kind of a one word or even one theory answer. So could you kind of lay the, the groundwork, map out what these different theories are, and then let's take a deeper dive into them and maybe see if we can uncover some of the pros and cons of each of these approaches? Sure. There are actually a lot, a lot of atonement theories. And so I just want to run through some of them today. Uh, we're not going to cover all of them, but I'm going to run through uh, Christus Victor, Satisfaction Theory, Penal Substitutionary Atonement, Moral Influence or Moral Exemplar Theory, and Scapegoat Theory. And I just want to sort of explain them a little bit and then assess what they're based on in the Bible, like what are their biblical foundations or underpinnings, if you want to say that, and then talk about sort of some positives of each and some problems of each. Excellent. Okay, well, well let's just jump, yeah. jump right in. Okay. Do you want to start with uh, this very fancy sounding one, the Christus Victor? Yeah, who's that? Christus, yes, right. <laughs> um, first, That's right. I'm going to name my next kid that. <laughs> yeah. First, I do want to say something for those of you out there who maybe don't know what atonement theory uh, is, because it's really not something that comes up a lot in churches. It's it's in the background of everything we say. Like when you, he- when you hear someone say, Jesus paid the price for our sins, or Jesus took our punishment, or took our place, or Jesus defeated death and Satan on the cross, though there's actually an atonement theory in the background of those statements, right? And so that's what I want to do is kind of talk about um, what's working in the background as we say some of these statements about Jesus's life, death, resurrection, ascension. So in Christus Victor, this is, this is a theory that's forged from battlefield imagery. So all of these you're going to see are all metaphors sort of used to explain metaphors from the Bible. Um, so here in this model, it has roots actually in the early church, uh, and it's made a recent resurgence in the last 50 years or so when a guy named Gustav Allen articulated this theory in his book. And it, it kind of caught on in the public imagination more and the academy. People started talking about it more. But basically, what it says is that Jesus's life, death, and resurrection are like the conclusion to this dramatic battle between God and the forces of evil. Jesus becomes the victor over Satan and all the evil forces in the world when he dies and raises from the dead. In some of these versions, Jesus' death somehow breaks the power of evil that holds humanity captive. And if you want to envision this and you know about the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when Aslan breaks the stone table, right, and he bests the White Witch, that sort of is a good illustration for what the Christus Victor theory does. Okay, so you mentioned earlier biblical underpinning. So with Christus Victor, again, I think all of these probably have some rootedness in the biblical imagery. And the challenge is, is a lot of these are metaphors and pictures that we get. But what's the biblical underpinnings of this Christus Victor theory? Yes. So, there is a battle, victory, sort of freedom motif that runs throughout the New Testament, and it shows up in different strands of metaphors. So, one metaphor might be a ransom scenario that Jesus, Jesus' death somehow paid a price to free us from sin or evil or Satan. Other metaphors imply that Jesus' life or death and resurrection defeated Satan and the powers of evil in a very dramatic way by triumphing over them. When you want to think about the ransom aspect, there's a focal verse in Mark, in Mark 10, 45, where Jesus says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So, some proponents of the ransom theory of atonement, which was like an earlier version of this, uh, they interpret this one word, ransom, to mean that God had to pay Satan to obtain humanity's freedom. But that is a very fanciful reading of this phrase. Like Mark most likely uses the word ransom in a, in a general way, referring to the price paid to free a slave. Mm-hmm. He actually does not explain how Jesus' life was a ransom or to whom this ransom was paid. You know, C.S. Lewis, he, he, um, he does take it sort of because you mentioned him before. Yes. Right? He, uh, he takes it as paying something that's due to the white witch. Yes. He's yeah. a Satan figure. So, he probably knew better. It just made a great story, I think. It was a know, great story. Maybe. It's just inter- interesting how <laughs> uh, how the Satan figure is a, is female, but anyway, we don't we don't have to talk yes. about that right now. That's a whole other podcast, you know, <laughs> we'll have you on to talk about that one. That's so, right. So, all the all the like this theory and all these theories are not just theories grabbed out of thin air. There are actually they're all trying to grapple 
with biblical themes and texts and concepts that lend themselves towards different ways of thinking about the significance of the cross. That's right. And sometimes they tie different motifs together, too. So, when you're talking about Christus Victor, not only does it, this ransom idea comes in, but the idea of freedom, that Jesus frees us from the power of evil, frees the earth from the influence of Satan or from evil, right? And even if you see that coming up in different places in the New Testament, it's all still a bunch of mixed metaphors, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. one example is like in Colossians 2, this one, people like this one for the Christus Victor model. When you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. And he set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. So, even in that little section, you can see that idea of freedom and triumphing over the powers, but there's a bunch of other metaphors sort of sprinkled in there, you know, circumcision and forgiving our trespasses, erasing records, legal demands, right? So, Mm -hmm. I think it's a good example of how there are so many different metaphors in the Bible about Jesus' death, and we're just trying to make the best sense of them that we can with with these theories. Right. And that's why it's hard to sort of pick out, like, the way the Bible talks about the cross, because they have these different metaphors. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the metaphors will be just coming from Paul. Yeah. But the good thing about Chris's Victor is you actually see this a little bit in the Gospels, too, which is good. Mm-hmm. In, in, all, in all the Gospels, especially Mark, but we see Jesus' power over demons and sickness, over the corrupt forces of the world, of, over the chaos of waters, all this stuff. And so, it does come up, but when you sort of put it together in a package called Christus Victor, you know, it's not exactly biblical, but it is biblical, you know? Mm-hmm. So, okay, so Christ is the victor in a battle. Yes. Right, and there, that's, I guess, an important metaphor way back in the day yes. when you've got all these, you know, oppressive forces and things like that. And it was, I'm, I'm trying to backtrack to what you said earlier, the um, very early on in the history of the church, this was sort of a big deal, a way of thinking about it, perhaps. And then it sort of died away, but then came back more in the last 50 years or so, right? Yes. I mean, and they've been trying to make it a little less violent. I think the violent imagery bothers some people, and so recently it hasn't been as violent. Like, there's even someone who who talks about the narrative Christus Victor, um, but it does do a good job of um, paying homage to what's happening in Scripture, especially when you read Revelation and sort of the apocalyptic imagery. And and not to kind of foreshadow, but I think one thing that maybe it solves but also creates other problems with, though, is it gives a lot of power to whatever this evil force is. And Mm -hmm. again, some people might call that Satan. Mm -hmm. or So, it's almost like there's an equal – it's almost the yin and yang. So, there's God and then there's this evil force and God's in this cosmic battle, which frankly is kind of like an ancient Near Eastern maybe Mm -hmm. way of understanding all this stuff. But – I think for some people that might be a little bit uncomfortable of like, okay, so there's this force that actually is pretty powerful. Like, God has to sacrifice Jesus Mm -hmm. in order to defeat this pretty powerful My hands are tied. My hands are tied. I got to do something. So, So is that that, that a thing that people might say as like maybe going against this view? Yes, that's one of the negatives for sure, this potential for dualism. And a lot of times early on, it was, they said it was Satan, like. God had to had to rescue us all from Satan, and it gives Satan kind of a lot of power in this. And that's one reason why Anselm um, sort of came up with the satisfaction theory after that, because not only are we kind of un, uncomfortable with the idea of Satan having that much power, but, but he was as well. Okay. So, Anselm, when did he live and what did he say? Yeah, so Anselm's living during the 1100s, the feudal times, right? And so, what he does is sort of come up with a theory that makes sense in his context, right? So, in the feudal system, you have these feudal lords and everybody sort of owes honor to these feudal lords. And he takes the metaphors from the New Testament and he makes them into metaphors that make sense. 
sense to the people he's he's teaching. And so the idea here is that Jesus' death has to satisfy the honor of God, right? We, we have wronged God, and God's honor has been impugned. And so the only way that we can uh, make restoration for that is for Jesus to die. So very much caught up in this f- feudal idea. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's a kind of an honor and shame mm-hmm. factor. So yeah. how does that, I, I think it might actually be with this satisfaction uh, theory, I wonder if contrasting it with this uh, penal substitutionary atonement theory might actually help us understand it, because in some ways, we don't live in an honor-shame kind of culture, at least in the West, Mm -hmm. here in America, 21st century. Um, So, that may not land as much. But, well, maybe before we go there, would that have landed more, though, in the ancient world, like in the actual biblical world? Because, you know, we're big on, like, context Mm -hmm. and understanding the world of the Bible, Would honor shame have been part of that ancient context? Yeah, I mean, honor shame is part of the context of the writers and the people in the biblical world. But I think what what happens that Anselm Anselm does is makes it about God's honor. Like he kind of takes it out of the human chessboard or something and makes it off stage. Right, and he starts talking about God's honor, like God is a feudal lord. And so, in that way, I think he 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 jumps out of the biblical world and off the biblical pages um, to to use metaphors from his own context. Yeah, I think. I mean, he he probably. I, I mean, the irony here is that I think he's definitely jumping off the pages of the New Testament, where God willingly aligns God's self with an act of shame. Mm-hmm which is the cross itself. Mm -hmm. The thing, I mean, I I totally agree with you. I think the reason why this might still get some support, even maybe in an indirect way, is you do see some of this stuff in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, not throughout, but, you know, God's honor is at stake, you know, and somebody has to, you know, the whole scene with Moses in the Exodus story, and, you know, I'm going to wipe everybody out because they've, they've disobeyed me, I'm looking bad. And Moses says, well, you know, you don't want to just wipe these people out because what's Egypt going to say? You know, your honor is at stake here. So, there's 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 something of, which is frustrating to me, frankly, <laughs> you know, but, you know, we have an ancient Bible, what are you going to do? So, you know, Anselm, he's in his own context, I guess, is speaking of a feudal system and and, you know, wronging a superior you you can't just let that shame go and and um i don't know we still Jared, we 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 have that sort of in our culture not like that i'm pretty shameless you know. are i know <laughs> Well, what, I've, what happens if a student disses you in class or something? Say, uh, how dare you? Do you have doctors? I'm, I'm not petty. Yeah, I'm not petty. I'm not petty. So, okay. Well, I want to jump into penal substitutionary atonement yeah, because it's the one. fancy sounding one. Mm-hmm. It has the most letters in it. Um, and it's probably the one that most people are, are maybe most familiar with. So, can you just talk to us about that? So, we talked about Christus Victor. We talked about satisfaction. Talk to us about this. PSA or penal substitutionary atonement. Yeah, I'll probably call it PSA from here on out because it's yeah, just go hard for to it, say. Yeah, yeah. Aggress. Okay, so PSA is actually sort of a more modern version of Anselm satisfaction theory, and so it really doesn't come about um, until we're talking about Calvin and Luther, the reformers, right in the in the you know, 16th century. But it's it, there's a lot of legal imagery happening here in PSA, right? You get the vocabulary of justice and judgment and punishment and debts and things like that. And so the premise of PSA is that God's justice, so now we're not talking about God's honor, Mm -hmm. we're talking about God's justice, cannot allow sin to go unpunished. So divine justice requires uh, that payment must be made to satisfy that justice. Some people actually bring in the language of God's wrath, like in order to ease or appease God's wrath, the payment has to be made. So in this scenario, God sends Jesus to suffer the punishment for human sin in order to pay that penalty for us. All of this should be sounding familiar too, because this is the language lots of evangelical churches, all of them probably use. Mm -hmm. So with Jesus' death then, God's holiness or God's justice are both satisfied by the substitution of Jesus for sinful humanity. So that's where you get the substitutionary Mm -hmm. part of that. And yeah, so it's actually sort of recent. Like it doesn't go back to the early church fathers like Christus Victor does, and it doesn't go back to uh, the 12th century like satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's this legal 
context, right? right. That um, remind me, Luther was training to be a lawyer. Yes, is that right? yes, I can't remember. yes. So he and is Luther, speaking in his context, right. in his from what he knows, and also to his context, right? I mean, what a reminder it is that it's hard to do theology and leave your own context and, hmm. and the what we bring into it, right? I mean, Absolutely. It's just, I find that fascinating. It's also frustrating, but also a little mm-hmm. bit liberating because mm-hmm. you you know you can look at these things and say, well, why why have people in the church thought this? Well, there was a pretty major. The whole Protestant Reformation, in a sense, mm. was really deeply, deeply rooted in this model of the atonement mm-hmm. and what the cross did. And I I don't know. I just it's nice to know that. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and there's also though there's. The, the the complicated thing is that there's a lot of context, you know, whether it's Anselm in the 12th century or Luther and Calvin and their legal background. There's a lot kind of brought into the text, but there's also some hooks within the text too. So, you know, we talked some about the passages in Mark for Christus Victor. Yeah. What are sort of these passages for PSA? And and why, you know, how have we grounded this in the text? Yeah, right. So, this is so interesting to me because, in my opinion, looking at the New Testament sort of overarching message of the New Testament, PSA has the shakiest biblical support of all these major atonement theories. But what people do is they will pluck these verses of Scripture and kind of tie them together in order to support mm-hmm. the idea of, of penal substitutionary atonement. So, it, it, it's kind of annoying because it makes it sound like it's very quote-unquote biblical, but it, it, it's really uh, cherry-picked, I guess is one way to say it, mm-hmm. right? Yep. There's definitely a sacrifice motif in the New Testament when it comes to Jesus' death, for sure. And loosely, maybe, it can be interpreted as substitution. But there's also a lot of the, you know, different motifs that are combined with the sacrifice. And it feels like the PSA people will just pluck out those little sacrifice can, words or things before, like that. Yeah, can, we, can we back up? Because you just mentioned something that I think people maybe, if they're not familiar, right, I think people are familiar with the language around it or the idioms or the cliches. Mm-hmm. But can you just... When you say penal and substitutionary and atonement, can you maybe just for one minute on each of those words? Because I think it might be confusing because you say right. it may be, yeah, substitutionary might be hard to find. Mm-hmm. So, Ed, Ed, can you just break those down real quick? Yeah, yeah. So, the pe- the penal part, of course, has to do with paying a payment. Or some people will say, you know, you committed a crime and you have to face the punishment. So, Jesus takes your place with the punishment. So, that's in the, the penal part. The substitution also comes in there in that in that he has to substitute himself for you. So, like, it, it, both of those things are working together mm-hmm. in this theory. So, there's a crime committed. There's a crime that's committed. That's the penal. Right. And then Jesus substitutes himself for you who should get the punishment. Right. That's the substitutionary part. Right. And the crime is against God's justice, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. You know, although, I mean, um, speaking of maybe the shaky foundation for this, mm-hmm. um, I, I'm, a thought came to my mind. I can't remember where I read this, but, you know, Jesus died for you. Mm-hmm. Doesn't necessarily mean instead of you and took your place. That's right. Right? It means on your behalf, which doesn't explain the mechanism, Mm -hmm. right? The whole idea of like, okay, what exactly did the death of Christ do? Mm -hmm. But it's not saying what in English it sometimes comes across as saying. And, you know, I remember a few years ago, Jennifer, just, I I don't even know what I was reading, nothing to do with the cross or anything. I just sort of stopped reading. I looked out the window and I said, I have no idea what the cross is about anymore. I just don't know. It's just, it's so, there are so many different ways of looking at it. And sometimes what you think is so plain and obvious in the text is at best a creative reading of it, if not in some cases a misunderstanding of it, you know, so. Yeah, well, keep, I mean, if you don't mind, keep going with that a little bit, because this, this is the big one, right? right? This it is, is. There aren't too many moral exemplar people out there we haven't gotten to no. that or, You know, Chris is Victor, but, you know, PSA is is the central and and most clearly, well, the only one. It is the biblical notion of what Jesus' death meant. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe we can pick that apart a little bit here. And again, not to destroy people's lives, but just to... 
Yeah, a little bit. Destroy people's <laughs> lives. No, not too much. But you know, well, no, it's, it's just, to give the, the diversification of the fact that in the history of the church, this is not the only way of thinking about it. And for good reason, because the Bible mm-hmm. itself is a little bit ambiguous about yeah. some of this stuff. And it's also relatively recent in terms of right, the history of the church. Right. So, yeah. so yeah, maybe maybe we'll again go back to like some of those biblical underpinnings. Like where do people find this in the Bible? Yeah, so you know, I told you I grew up Southern Baptist and so we used to have these little tracks that we would put on people's cars that's you know, do you know Jesus? And then it was an evangelism track. And so many times um, it had the Roman road or the Romans road on it, different verses, you Mm. know, sort of from Romans explaining things. And this is sort of the key one. It's in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then it goes on and just kind of listen as I as I read this to kind of see all the different imagery that comes up here, all the different metaphors. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a sacrifice of atonement. We're going to get back to that word in a second. By His blood, effective through faith. God did this to show God's own righteousness because in God's divine forbearance, God has passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that God is just and God justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. So you you see, you hear all the words coming up, the just and the righteousness and all those things. But it also says that God had passed over sins previously. It it brings up this term, uh, sacrifice of atonement. And in the Greek, it's hilasterion. And people take that word and they will translate it as propitiation or expiation, all these huge words that no one ever really knows what they mean when they say them. But it really is just a general term that used to talk about like the atonement seat, the atoning place, right? And it's, and it seems that the New Testament writers use it in a general way to kind of talk about the sacrificial system in general. But what, what we do is when we translate the words and we explain them, we say, oh, this is a propitiation. This is an expiation. This is a sacrifice of atonement. But we, we we don't know what the words mean. We don't know how the authors were really using them. They're very vague. And so this is how it happens that people who support PSA will pick these verses out and say, see, it says propitiation right here. It says justice right here. But they don't realize there's a whole system of metaphors working and a whole Old Testament that's behind this, right? And they're just defining the words by how they have heard their pastor define it or whatever. Yeah, so there's a lot of metaphors going on, or at least concepts that are worth digging in. Right. Because I think we make assumptions about what they mean, and we're kind of importing our tradition's baggage within those definitions. But I have to say this before we move on too much further, which is one of my problems with this uh, theory is it it doesn't solve this old... I, I think it actually creates another problem for people, just even philosophically or conceptually, which is... If we have to say that God has to, because of God's justice, do something, we're kind of back to Plato's, you know, the, the fancy term is Euthyphro's dilemma, right? Mm. Where Plato's like, okay, well, if the gods have to do something, aren't the things that God has to do, those are more like gods than the gods. Mm. So, then it kind of puts justice as the thing that God has to abide by. Right. And in a lot of, in my tradition, nothing, God doesn't have to do anything. Mm. We'd say things like, well, God's ways are above our ways, right? Mm -hmm. And so, when something looks unjust, it's not unjust because God kind of defines what justice is. And yet now, when it comes to like this most important part of our faith, which is like what happens with Jesus' death and resurrection, now all of a sudden God's hands are tied Mm -hmm. and God has no choice but to follow this thing called justice. Um, And so, it just, it always irks me a little bit of like, okay, well, who's God here? So, whenever we can't explain things, God is the most important thing. And Mm -hmm. our definition of justice has to just, whatever God does is just. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to like Jesus's death and resurrection, justice is the most important thing and God's hands are kind of tied. And we just have to say, well, you know, Mm -hmm. God just had to do this. It just gets really frustrating to me. So, even, even beyond the, the biblical text, it's just, it, It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. No, it doesn't. And it doesn't actually make sense in the biblical text either, Um, like as you're reading (laughs) through. And even if you're looking at the Gospels and you see sort of the way that Jesus, you know, taught, this is not the picture of God that we got, that God's hands are tied, that God is, you know, waiting for somebody to die so that God can forgive us. You know, when you're thinking about um, the parable of the prodigal son, you know, the father forgives the son when he comes back before he even, you know, says anything. And so, we, we get, it's a very different picture of God than we get in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Does it, can I, I don't want to go back maybe to the Hebrew Bible, but just pause the language here in Romans 3 of 
um, passing over sin, which seems to have some Passover, you know, references, obviously, and overtones. How do people who advocate for PSA uh, talk about how God was able to forgive sins before Jesus? Yeah, that's a good question. I think some of them will, will sort of use this like retroactive, like after, you know, Jesus' death, God went back and retroactively forgave. But that, that's really not a good reading of the Old Testament or a good reading of the Gospels either. So, <laughs> that's how they mm-hmm. do it. That's how they define it, I guess. Okay. Right. Okay. It was always true even before Jesus. Right. And, and – um, but, but you know, that sort of takes the shock out of the system in a sense, the way Paul talks about it. Like, li- listen, this marvelous thing has happened. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't this way before. Right. And, I, I, you know, just, you know, Jennifer, because you brought up Romans 3, I just want to encourage the people who are listening. Romans 3 is a passage worth spending a lot of time studying and not assuming mm-hmm. what is happening because there's a lot of stuff going on there and you know we're just touching on some of them here but mm-hmm. even words like redemption mm-hmm. you know redeem is like a rescue word it's it's not it's not a sacrifice an animal by the blood you know it's 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 a it's a different kind of word and you know god did this to show god's own righteousness and you know again in in modern evangelicalism we talk about the righteousness of god and that is um, a sort of like an inner character of God, like you know, a basic part of his constituents, uh, you know, his his what he's how God is constituted, and we're not, you know, we're unrighteous. God is righteous, but righteous there is it doesn't mean that it means you know God's righteousness is God's act in redeeming humanity. Mm-hmm. It's it's an act of faithfulness, and it's not. Like, mm-hmm. God is the pure, righteous, sovereign Lord looking down, and thou shalt not gaze on the, this mm-hmm. Lord because this Lord is perfect and mm-hmm. you're not. It's the, the righteousness of God is what God does. It's God's right action. Right, exactly, mm-hmm. yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I just – and just, I mean, I want to sort of push people a little bit to feel like – to feel the responsibility of studying passages like that and preferably maybe even outside of our comfort zones from people we might not normally read you know, commentary, study Bibles, things like that, because it is actually an amazing piece of, you know, mm. theology from Paul. It just doesn't mean what people typically think it means. Right. Well, and, and not to even make it even broader, but I always like to point out, if you read the first 11 chapters and how Paul sort of tries to end this conundrum mm-hmm. that he sort of, he works himself into a bit of a knot and is trying to figure it out, and at the end... He just ends in this doxology right? Mm-hmm. of like, who knows the mysteries yeah. of God? <laughs> so, it's like, we just try to like... Put I've just wasted 11 <laughs> chapters on you good people. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's like, so. we think Paul's like got it all figured out and he's writing this treatise, but even in the larger context of that letter, it sort of ends with like, uh, you know what? I mean, who can understand the ways of God, really? Um, so I just, yeah, I, I, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? But I think that's a good, really good point to make. Yeah, Jared, I think that you got the word right there, mystery, right? Even Paul recognizes this. All of this is a mystery, right? And I think that we have lost that concept of the mystery of not just God, but what God is doing in Jesus. And so we don't want mystery. We want to be able to give it these concrete words and and diagrams and you know a PowerPoint presentation about it, but we, we've lost the mystery. But I mean, if Paul acknowledged it, even as he's trying to explain it, like how are we to think we, we don't have mystery, we don't need mystery? Um, and that's probably why we God. have multiple approaches to that's atonement, right. even within the page of the New Testament. Okay, we have a couple more to go here. So, mm. let's, let's try to hit those. The moral exemplar or influence theory, could you just explain that? Because that's I don't know if that's common today or not, but it used to be pretty darn common. It's not that common. Um, It it was kind of rejected by the Protestant Reformers, and and a lot of evangelical Christians today um, would reject it. But it's actually as old as Anselm's um, satisfaction theory, and it actually has found some acceptance among progressive Christians um, over the years, right? So Peter Abelard was the guy who developed this theory in the 12th century, and he's trying to account for the love of God. Uh, and for the impact of Jesus' ministry on the lives of Christians. And, and so basically, the purpose and result of Christ's death was to move humans toward moral improvement or right action. So it denies that Christ died to satisfy any principle of divine justice and teaches instead that, that Jesus' whole life culminating in his death was designed to display God's love uh, and to lead people to repentance, 
to reconciliation with God um, and to transformation. Mm-hmm. So again, just because we we spent a little time on Romans three, what are are there any? Was Abelard leaning on the Bible in any of this? Yes. Um, the, the, the theme of God demonstrating love in Jesus is, is sort of ubiquitous in the New Testament, you know, and also imitating Jesus in that. Paul talks about it in Philippians, you know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Jesus and John calls the disciples to love others like he loved them and be willing to lay down their lives. Jesus encourages the disciples in the Synoptic Gospels to take up their cross and follow him. And so it's all throughout the Gospels. Um, but one focal verse uh, is Romans 5 8. But God demonstrates God's love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so there's that died for us language, but but it reads very differently here, um, right, than the, the penal substitution or sacrifice, right? God showed Showing us God's love, mm-hmm. and, and it's a beautiful metaphor. And the people who have picked up on it, um, I, I think, what happens is these are the people that end up uh, really emulating the life of Jesus uh, in the in their walks mm-hmm. of faith. You know, there's one thing you just said that that triggered something. I think it's really important how there's even language of sacrifice here, mm-hmm. right? In 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 Romans, in in something that probably supports another kind of theory. These things overlap, mm-hmm. you know, and and just seeing the word sacrifice, you can't take that and load it full of, let's say, penal substitutionary atonement. Mm-hmm. That's Because, again, the mechanism of how the sacrifice does something, that's – that's not explained very well, mm-hmm. frankly, is it? I mean, I don't think it's explained no, well. That's no. why it's frustrating to me. It's just you have these metaphors, you have these um, ways of thinking that made sense to people back then, and there was a whole background to it. But we've lost that, and so we sort of inject it with, you know, essentially late medieval theology hmm. when you have Luther and Calvin, and and to just. It's it's okay to say I don't quite understand how this atonement thing works, you know, and and I'm going to try to embrace the different voices in the New Testament. Well, that seems like a whole other podcast of where again my tradition, more as an evangelical, was that our entire salvation of whether we go to heaven or hell is whether or not we mentally agree to penal substitutionary mm-hmm. atonement. Mm-hmm. That's what, like we were not allowed the mystery of that because our like eternal salvation yes, depended on, sure on that. be certain yeah. on the theory, right? Which the Bible itself it complicates that. And this is how it works exactly. And you must believe exactly this how it exactly works. Yeah. It's like you don't man, have to. You don't I, just I read the trust, Bible. I can't do that. You don't just trust that Jesus does yeah. something. It's this is that how. you have to believe this yeah. is how. Right. And right. that's how you get saved. With your whole heart. Mm. Right. And if you don't, eh. Yeah. Or part of your heart over several times, right? Yeah. I, I asked Jesus into my heart like eight times. <laughs> right. I think there's a, a little piece took every time, so yeah. it took a while. But, well, I, I think we could just talk so much about this, yeah. and, and we have so many questions. But let's get to this scapegoat theory. What's the what's the, the, the next our last one? our last, our last for today. theory for today? Right. So uh, this is a uh, this is a newer theory, right? It, it comes from Rene Girard, and he was a literary critic and an anthropologist and a theologian, like very interdisciplinary. Um, but what he does is he first is analyzing human cultures uh, and their language um, and their literature, and he proposes um, that there's this problem common to all humanity, and he calls it mimetic violence. And so he goes on and talks about how human societies all across the world um, deal with this violence that becomes cyclical by focusing their conflict on a single victim, a scapegoat. And you can see this in um, all different societies. Um, You can see it in the Old Testament as well. And so this outsider or marginalized person or animal will bear the burden of blame, um, and then that violence in society will sort of ease for a little bit. And so, what Gerard says when he gets to the New Testament, he says, well, Jesus is is the last scapegoat, or he's supposed to be this last scapegoat, because when he dies, then the gospel writers tell his story and, and show, look, he's innocent, and we human beings scapegoated him and killed him. And in that revelation that the Gospels make, um, it helps us understand our own nature and our own scapegoating tendencies, and then that frees us from the cycle of violence. And mm-hmm. so, you know, in a way, it's close to the moral influence theory in that we're we're sort of being uh, freed from ourselves. You know, we're being saved from ourselves as human beings. We need to follow Jesus, but it's not that, you know, God needs to be appeased or anything like that, but we need to recognize the violence at the heart of our societies, and then we can move forward and stop and stop the sin. So, it also 
I mean, I think you said this indirectly, but I, if, if, if this is right, I think it's important for people to hear. It, 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 I mean, not to overstate, it sort of corrects bad views of God. Yes, it does. Because, right? yeah, because. Yeah, flush it out a little bit. That, so, what they say is um, what Gerard says is that this whole idea of d- divine violence, that, you know, God needs blood or God needs uh, a sacrifice or God needs to punish Jesus or all those things, all that violence, even throughout the Old Testament, is actually our own violence that we're, we're looking in a mirror and then we're like, projecting that violence onto God. Mm -hmm. And so this is where a lot of people can't swallow this theory. They don't like that idea that we've projected our violence onto God. But there are lots of people now who are exploring more nonviolent atonement theologies Mm -hmm. here and Mm -hmm. and. And, and, and I think it's really intriguing. I think it's something that we need to consider. So few people uh, know about Gerard or read about him, uh, but it does uh, it does make sense, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, he's an he was an anthropologist. He was, yeah. Right, part, partly what what he did. And you know, look. I mean, again, this is not the word that's going to help everybody, but looking at the evolution of religion, mm-hmm. blood's been there from a very very early time, long before the Israelites ever came on the scene. And it's almost as if how else could the ancient Israelites have expressed a devotion to their God apart from a sacrificial blood-oriented system? And I mean, the way I, I, I think Gerard is complicated, and you know a lot more about him than I do. I just – he's French, whatever. <laughs> you know, he's just a smart guy, but won all these awards. But, you know, in the cross – it's it's like God saying that's it, mm. we're done with this now. Mm. You know, we're done with we're done with scapegoating. We're done with putting your scapegoating on me. Mm. <laughs> Even though the Old Testament might do this occasionally, and maybe the New Testament too, I mm. don't know. But it's it's sort of a break with it's a, it's a dramatic theory. You know, it's it's at least as I understand it, it's it's a break with the way humans have always done it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, and that's why I find it very liberating. And if I, even if I don't quite understand it, but that's that's my sabbatical project. Trying to oh. understand very much Gerard. <laughs> I mean, I feel, I, I feel like, yeah. I mean, we. It would help us so much if we could just pick up Gerard and easily read him. Like he's not, <laughs> he's not easy yeah. to read. But just right. like the moral influence theory, I mean, what happens is that you see change in people. You know, and and I think what ha- what is the really negative about PSA is that people say, okay, God did all the work. You know, all I have to do is believe, and then the the change, the transformation, the long cycle of reconciliation to God just isn't there. You know, yeah, and so this yeah, is the right. strength of scapegoat theory and moral influence theory that we are participating in this. You know, it's not something that happens off the stage of history, and oh, I don't have to do anything about it now. But we're we're in it. We're in it, right? Right, exactly, and. And, you know, one thing is that how, I mean, even the way that I describe my own take on it, you have to, to work with that, you have to think about the Bible differently mm-hmm. and the revelation of God in history, it, like in the Hebrew Scriptures, differently than what I think an evangelical system would be comfortable with. Yeah. And I understand, I disagree with them, but I understand the, that problem because if, you know, Israel just does what Israel does and understands God because of its being a tribal culture, Mm -hmm. rather than this is God ordaining from Mount Sinai, you will sacrifice here and here, and this is what I need. You know, it just, it can create certain problems for people, but, uh, you know, in a sense, the root of all, the the root of that problem, again, is what is the Bible and what do you do with it, which is what we talk about here a lot. It's really, we keep circling back to that question of what we expect the Bible to be doing, and looking at it anthropologically mm-hmm. can, I think, very often be a healthy corrective to sort of a rule book reading of it and saying, well, this is just what it says. We can't interrogate it or question it or anything like that. Absolutely. Yeah, so as we wrap up our time here, maybe just a few words from you about, you know, we talked about all these different theories, and I know some people want the answer, which is like, which one's, yeah, what's the, actually what's the right one here? <laughs> You've got so 10 seconds. to those people, like, how would you kind of wrap up, kind of, in all your studies, how have you come to mm-hmm. land on some of this stuff? Yeah, so I really like what New Testament scholar Joel B. Green suggests, and other, and other scholars do as well, but there's not just one theory that can capture 
what he calls the kaleidoscopic picture of atonement that we get in the biblical witness. So we can't just, you know, throw these out there and say, which one do you like best? You pick, you know? It's much better to think of it as a kaleidoscope. There are lots of different metaphors, and images, and so we need to take these atonement theories, um, try to understand them, but realize that there is mystery and there's also lots of things happening, um, lots of things going on. Like if I were to describe it like a tree, there are all these different branches that come out that are atonement theories, right? In different contexts, Anselm's speaking to his context and Calvin and Luther are speaking to their context, and we're still in a different context than t- context than those. So we're still more branches are you know coming out of this tree, um, and so we need to look at it as a whole. I, the thing that bothers me is that at one point we have to say, are there some diseased branches that need to be cut out. Mm. Uh, The ones that do not illuminate the idea of salvation in the biblical witness, but they actually distort it. And the fruit of them is actually rotten. And, you know, I've really been thinking and studying and wondering if if PSA isn't one of those, you know, diseased branches. Um, There are lots of theologians that try to still incorporate it into their, you know, multi-layered ideas of atonement, but I, I don't know. Yet sometimes the tensions may be too unbearable to hold them all right. together. So you know, mm-hmm. yeah. yes. Well, and, right. and sometimes, like you said, it, it may not even be necessary that in in theory or the concept of the theory, but just how it's borne out in the world. Yes, it That's maybe right. does more harm than good sometimes, and so it may not be salvageable language to to hold on to. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. right. I mean, it would be hard to it would be hard to cut that off because so much of our language, so much of our music, the hymnology that we have in the church, it revolves around PSA. Mm-hmm. But I mean, there's got to be, I think, a way to yeah. to explain it better so it doesn't lead us away from Jesus and Scripture, but but leads us toward that. Excellent. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for walking us through, which I think can be a, a really complicated and personal. Uh, topic around atonement theories and Jesus and, and all of that. So, just thank you so much for, for walking us through that in such a, a smart and helpful way. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, we'll talk to you again soon, and uh, you'll be popping up here and again. You're a friend of the podcast. You've done a course for us in the past and all that good stuff. So, we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thanks so much. See you later. You just made it through another entire episode of The Bible for Normal People. Well done to you, and well done to everyone who supports us by rating the podcast, leaving us a review, or telling others about our show. We are especially grateful for our producers group who support us over on Patreon. They are the reason we are able to keep bringing podcasts and other content to you. So a big thanks to Mark Graham, Nathan Kelly, Melanie Wright, Jordan, Sarah Overly, Caleb Sharp, Jeff Gwynn, Chad Gilstrap, Willard Vaughn, and Marlon Wall. If you'd like to help support the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash the Bible for Normal People, where for as little as $3 a month, you can receive bonus material, be part of an online community, get course discounts, and much more. We couldn't do what we do without your support. Our show is produced by Stephanie Spate, audio engineer Dave Gerhardt, creative director Tessa Stoltz, and web developer Nick Striegel. For Pete, Jared, and the entire Bible for Normal People team, thanks for listening. And Jennifer is associate... No. God damn it. <laughs> David. David. <laughs>